so when we think about alkyl halides, right, we're dealing with the chlorides, bromides, iodide. I'm just drawing a few here, for example. Okay. Um, also, fluorides are in this. Um, you'll see that we don't deal with fluorides very often. Uh, they are halides, but um, because of their, their chemistry, the carbon fluoride bond is, is actually uh, pretty unique. Um, I'll give you an example of what we mean by unique. Uh, Teflon is a fully fluorinated hydrocarbon. Um, and you can see it's nonstick and, and it's very stable. You can heat it up with all kinds of acidic and, and basic foods, right? You can cook with it and it doesn't do much. So the carbon fluoride chemistry is, is somewhat unique and then actually in many cases it's studied all by itself. So what we're really gonna be looking at here is bromide, chloride and halide uh, and iodine uh, groups, okay? The two main reactions yeah. for this are gonna be substitutions. Yes, what do you have a question? Okay. The main two reactions we're gonna be looking at are substitutions and eliminations. The substitutions, we're gonna be substituting something. So if I have our halide represented by X, a nucleophile, right? We'd substitute the nucleophile for the halide. For eliminations, we bring in a base. And we eliminate. And so you can see what we're doing here. Let's color code it, right? So we are eliminating a, a hydrogen and a halide. Okay, so in this chapter, it's alkyl halides, but we're going to be looking at substitution and elimination reactions. That's the major reaction that we're going to be looking at, uh, reactions that we're going to be looking at uh, for. Uh, halides. So when you're thinking about alkyl halides, especially the iodine, uh, iodine, bromine, and chlorine, why are they particularly reactive? Well, first, whenever you add a halide on here, right, you're going to end up with a strong dipole moment. The Halides are very electronegative. That's going to confuse you, so let me draw it out, right? Those are electronegative. All right, the carbon is not very electronegative, which is going to end up giving us the partial positive, right, and the partial negative. And that's going to make this position electrophilic. Okay, so. First thing for alkyl halides is that because of this strong dipole bond, this polarization, we end it up with the electrophilic group. Now, when we're looking at uh, the other part of this is leaving groups. Halides, right, are really stable as themselves, right? Um, so therefore, They're very good leaving groups. Okay. So the first thing functionally when we look at alkyl halide is to realize that we have a strong dipole moment that gives us an electrophilic position and that the halide is a very stable electrophile, uh, leaving group, very stable leaving group. And if we look at our leaving group stabilities, we can think about our PKAs. And this is a chart from your book, right? That the more acidic something is, the stronger acids, 
right, are going to be more stable. So the conjugate base of a strong acid is going to be more stable. And so therefore our iodide, bromine, and chlorine are some of the more most stable of these. So these are very good leaving groups. And then as we get down into the group, right? So here we have water, not hydronium, right? Water is a good leaving group, but the hydroxide is a poor leaving group. Bad, I'd, I'd really use poor, good, bad, or, or more judgment <laughs> than, than, um, than, and then you can see here also the fluoride, right? The fluoride is not a great leaving group. Okay, so we have the hydronium, which then gives us water. We have our sulfonates, right? And then our halides. So in an alkyl halide, we get two things that make it very reactive for the substitution and eliminations. That is that I have an electrophilic and electron poor group because of this dipole moment. And if it leaves, right, either through elimination or through um, substitution, I've got, a, I've got a very good stable leaving group, right? And so the stronger the acid is, the more stable the conjugate base is. The other thing we need to watch for is that not all alkyl halides are the same. And what we're talking about here is the difference between an sp3 and an sp2. The sp3s are what we're gonna really be focusing on here. And sp2 um, type halide is not going to go through the same type of reactions, right? So when we think about substitution and elimination, that we're looking at in this chapter, that's gonna be sp3. So we're gonna look at you know, methyls, primary, secondary, tertiary. We'll look at that in just a second. Um, those are all dealing with sp3 carbons. And when we get to what the geometry of substitution is, you'll see why that particularly is an sp3 geometry. If we look at our sp2s, right, that's a different type of geometry. And therefore, it does not go through the same substitution and elimination reactions that we're talking about in this chapter. Okay, so whenever you see a halide, it's important to first verify that it's an sp3. And you do that, right, because you'll notice that there is a, a double bond. So if you got a halide attached to a double bond, that's going to be a different set of reactions that we'll get to. Well, you we probably won't get to those until chapter, uh, until uh, organic two. So let's look at nomenclature. Okay, the first nomenclature is to look at where we have our halide. So if we have our halide in that two position there, that's known as the alpha position. So where the halide is attached is known as the alpha. What is attached to it is then known as the uh, beta, so one away is beta, three away would be gamma, and if we had a fourth, that would be delta. The alpha and beta position. So where it's attached, that's where we're gonna be talking alpha. You'll also hear in a, in a little bit about the beta hydrogens. This is known as a beta hydrogen, right? And it's a beta hydrogen because that's the alpha position and that's the beta position. We also have some nomenclature on just structures from the different attachments. This one known as methyl, All right, primary, secondary and tertiary. And here we're looking at that carbon, how many carbons are attached to that carbon. Here we're looking again at the alpha carbon in the nomenclature we just covered, how many carbons are attached to it. And then 
here how many carbons are attached to that. Okay, so primary, secondary, tertiary, and of course here, there's no carbons attached to it. So we refer to that as a methyl. So one of the things that we're going, you're going to need to build up is a skill to just look at a molecule and start dissecting what's there, right? So what is my dipole moment, right? We, you covered that earlier. What's the dipole moment? Where is the electrophile? Uh, is it sp3? Is it sp2? Uh, where are my alpha and beta positions, right? And then is this primary, secondary, and tertiary? So by just looking at the structure, we can find, figure out the functionality, the primary functionality of the structure, right? So we're going from form to function. Nomenclature of naming these molecules, right, is pretty straightforward. If we look here, okay, here we have two bromo pentane. And so we name our parent group, that's five carbons. So five carbons, and then we want our group attached to the lowest number. So this is two, not four, so two bromo. And then for the halides, it's always chloro, bromo, iodo, um, so forth. If we look at the other one over here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so this is gonna be heptane, right? And then on the three position, we have three chloro, three, methyl heptane, okay? So halides are usually pretty straightforward to, to, to name. Okay, we have a question? Yes, I just wanted a clarification. So we, the name of the chain is the total number of carbon, right? Not the length of the main chain, primary chain, I guess. It's the length of the primary chain. Oh, did I name this one wrong? I did name this one wrong. Yeah, no, it's it's the longest chain. This should be one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Sorry, I, I counted that wrong. Hexane. No, it's the longest, longest continuous chain. So in this case, it should be hexane, not heptane. And the previous is pentane. Could you Thanks. explain the difference between alpha and gamma or alpha, beta, and gamma positions again? Yeah. So, whenever we look at uh, where the, the halide is attached, right, this position, right, that, that's going to be my alpha position. So, wherever I have my halide attached, right, my functional group, that's going to be the alpha position. One away from that is beta. And so, if we look at you know, a large structure like this. If I have my bromine here, where that bromine is attached, right, that is going to be my alpha position. One away from that then becomes my beta positions. Two away from that become my uh, gamma positions, right? And then, you know, we could continue that out to delta and. I don't know what the next Greek letter is. Usually by that point, you're, you're, you're done with the reactivity. So what this is looking at, right, is that the primary elect, uh, reactivity is going to be at the alpha. We're going to see the same type of thing. And this is pretty standard. If we looked at carbonyls, that carbonyl becomes my alpha, right? And then... Um, Sorry, uh, in this, this case, and I should have probably not brought that up. Let's talk about that when we get to carbonyls. Okay, so it's just a location. So you start with wherever your halide is attached. That's your your alpha, and then you go one out from that. Does that help? Yes. Okay. 
right? And so the alpha, beta, and gamma, you're not going to see in the IUPAC naming system, but you're going to see us refer to that over and over again, such as the beta hydrogen. The primary, secondary, and tertiary, again, you're not going to see in the IUPAC naming system, but where you're going to see us refer to that uh, as a classification for a group of molecules to know how they react. So the alpha, beta, gamma, that's to help you understand reactivity. The primary, secondary, tertiary, that's to help you understand reactivity. And then uh, the IUPAC name is, is what you've done so far. And, and I apologize, I, I misnumbered that one. So it is hexane, not heptane. Okay. Okay, questions about these? In most cases, you've probably already been looking at halide nomenclature because it's it's pretty straightforward. The book brings it up here just to make sure that it's been covered. So if we think about the possibility of substitution, right? We really we really have two options. Right, we could have a concerted mechanism where we have our alkyl halide and our nucleophile. And we get nucleophilic attack and loss of leaving group all in the same step. Okay, so going back to chapter six. So that's concerted, that would be a one-step process. The other potential option, if we think about substituting a halide, is going to be the stepwise process or the two-step process. In this case, We start with loss of our leaving group. And then attack. Of our nucleophile. Now, if we think about these two processes, what's going to be the, what is some of the, how can we determine the difference between these two processes experimentally? So we're doing a substitution. There's not many options, main options. There could be some minor changes to the process, uh, but the main options for substitution is either the leading group leaves first, and then the nuke file attacks, that's the two-step process, or this all happens in one step where the nuke file attacks the electrophilic position and the leaving group leaves all in one step. What's gonna be the difference in the uh, experimentally? So if we think about this experimentally, this is where we can use our rate, right? So we can look at kinetics, where we have rate equal to K times the concentration of the alkyl halide times the nucleophile, concentration of the nucleophile. Or well, we could have, go ahead. Will the stepwise process have intermediates that are? It will have intermediates. Okay. And we'll show that in just a second. So if we look at the kinetics of these, we can determine which of these are concerted versus which one is stepwise by looking at the rate law, 
right? So if we look at concerted, concerted is going to have both the nucleophile and the leaving group, uh, both the nucleophile and the substrate, right? The alkyl halide in, there's only one step, right? So it has to be there. So this is what we're gonna refer to as bimolecular. Right, both molecules are involved, and this is the concerted. The second one, right, this is going to be the, the rate law for stepwise, and we think it's probably going to take more energy to go from a alkyl halide to the carbocation than it will be for the nucleophile to react with the carbocation to give us the, the new product. Right, so this first step is probably going to be the slow step, which it is. And we could think about that just by the stability of our intermediates, since that's the slow step. Then we call this unimolecular. Right, and this is the stepwise process. If we want to look, as you brought up the energy diagrams of the two, the concerted is going to start and just go through a transition state where the stepwise, as you uh, wisely pointed out, is going to have an intermediate. And that intermediate, right, is the carbocation. Uh, I didn't leave myself enough space. And the carbocation is going to be higher energy. Because of the rate, we refer to the concerted by the bimolecular, we can refer to this concerted as SN2. So substitution, nucleophilic, bimolecular. Okay, this is, this will, this drives some people crazy. How many steps does a concerted mechanism have? One. What is the name of the concerted mechanism? SN2. Okay, so one step bimolecular SN2. The stepwise is known as SN1, substitution, right, nucleophilic. Unimolecular. Is there an actual like, reason behind that naming to make it easier to remember? Uh, you have to remember what the rate law is. So in the case of concerted, both of the, the species are involved in there. What you need to remember is that the name comes from the rate. So experimentally, they knew that something was substitution nucleophilic bimolecular before they actually knew what was happening with the electrons. So they knew the rate, that was an experimental. So they were able to figure out that the rate law was bimolecular. Later, they figured out that that bimolecular occurred this way. Similarly, they figured out that SN1 was unimolecular from its rate, right? We changed the concentration of alkyl halide but it didn't matter if we changed the concentration of the nucleophile, it's not in the rate. So therefore that was this step, which was a two-step process. 
So remember that the one and two don't refer to the steps, it refers to the kinetics. I have a quick question. So on the stepwise, mm -hmm. you still have the nucleophiles, just like the bimolecular ones. Uh, how come the nucleophile doesn't affect the rate for the stepwise the same way it does? Because of, so, so in the stepwise, the slow step is the first step. So the slow step controls uh, the speed. So if we think about trying to get to, um, let's say we're trying to get to Houston, right, um, from, from here. So we're gonna drive down to Houston and we've gotta go I-35 to I-45, right? What's gonna really determine how fast you get there, assuming that we all drive the speed limit, which is anywhere between 60 to 75, depending on, on where you are, right? So let's drive the speed limit. What's gonna actually determine how fast you get there? Well, how fast you can get through Dallas, right? Dallas is going to be the, the rate limiting step. And so that's, that is actually what's gonna determine your overall speed. In this case, what's gonna determine overall tell your speed is that first step. The second step is gonna happen relatively fast. So the slow step is the, the step that actually determines the kinetics, the speed. So in the stepwise, I can change the concentration of nucleophile all I want, but the truth is, is that it's going to be the, the slow step that's gonna determine my, my, my speed. In the case of my example, which is not really great, but hopefully can help, is let's say you drove 80 miles an hour, but it took you uh, two hours to get through Dallas. How much is that gonna impact your overall time to get to take the seven hour trip to Houston? Well, the two hours to get through Dallas is gonna affect it a whole lot more. And therefore the fact that you drove 80 um, isn't gonna make up the two hours that it took you to get through Dallas, right? So not exactly the same, but the way to think about it is it's a slower step that actually determines the rate. And in the stepwise, that slow step is the first step. I can add as much nucleophile as I can, but until the carbocation is there, there's nothing to react with. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, sir. Okay, yeah. All right. So again, the S and one, remember that the, the two stands for the bimolecular and the one stands for the unimolecular, not not the number of steps. This is this is how you people get it backward. If you remember S and two is bimolecular, um, then then that'll help. So what we're going to look at is we're going to spend some time looking at SN2, and then we're going to spend some time looking at SN1. Um, we know that SN2 I tend to show it uh, with a nucleophile negative. You'll see why in a minute. And I tend to show it with the nucleophile on the opposite side. And you'll see that in a minute as well. Okay, if we think about this process, and let's draw our three-dimensional, and what I hadn't shown before were my hydrogens, right? If we think about our nucleophile coming in, the nucleophile needs a place to start to react, right? Uh, in the case of the SN1, it's a carbocation, and we'll show that in a second. But here, these electrons have to go somewhere, right? And can they go between the carbon and the halide? Well, no, that's already occupied, right? That hybrid bond right there, this sp3, sp3 bond is already occupied. So this can't just insert in there, right, directly. So it's gotta go somewhere. So what we need to look at is where could that go? And so let's look at
it's not pretty, but it's there, right? Um, so if we look at our our hybrid hybrid hybridization, right? SB three, we have our SB three here. Is this everything on the SB three? What am I not showing? Is an SB three orbital just one lobe? No, remember it's got an anti-bonding lobe. So an SB3 is made of the S, right? And the three, three Ps. So therefore it has an anti-bonding lobe and a bonding lobe. So when I show it this way, what I have forgotten is all of my anti-bonding orbitals. Right? So when I look at my carbon up here, I have the halide and it's got its lone pairs, right? And, and my hydrogens, CH3, I've got an anti-bonding orbital 180 degrees on the back. So when my nucleophile comes in to attack, that's where the electrons are going. The electrons are going into that anti-bonding orbital that then creates a presence where I am inverting, and we'll show this a couple of different ways, and the book has some good pictures of this as well. That I am creating a bond, right, between my nucleophile and my carbocation. And so if we, what you'll see this one often is not with the orbital shown. But the transition state shown with the partial bond. So since the nucleophile has to come in to this backside, the nucleophile is always backside attack. So wherever that leaving group is, when I do a substitution, an SN2 substitution, I'm always gonna add the nucleophile 180 degrees from that, right? It has to be coming in from the backside which means that this is stereospecific. So if I have a stereocenter like this bromine here, and I react that with a good nucleophile, and we'll talk about good nucleophiles, in a minute, but here's cyanide. This is this is a rather good nucleophile. When this comes in, it's going to attack the back side of this, and this is going to be stereo specific. My nitrile, my my uh, yeah, my nitrile is going to be at the back side, right? Notice that I've inverted from the wedge to the dash. And that's because I have to attack that anti-bonding orbital. So SN2 reactions are stereospecific. So first thing we look at is stereo, stereochemistry for this reaction. Right, and this is stereospecific. Okay, let's look at our substrate. Okay, what is going to determine the speed at which the substrate can react? So if we think about this bromide, 
the cyanide coming in, the cyanide is having to come in very close, right, to that backside. Right? So again, if we think about what's happening here, I've got, and I'll redraw it. All right, so I've got my bromine. I've got a CH3 here. I've got a CH2, CH2, CH3. And I've got my hydrogen. Let's draw it this way instead. Sorry, I'm going to change my stereochemistry, right? And my cyanide, right, with its electrons has to come in and attack right there, right, to kick this off. And let's change our color so we can track that a little better. Nobody wants hot pink. Okay, so here we go here that way, right? And the bromine comes off, right? So for this to react, that nitrile has to get inside of this, right? And so we can think about the fact that these other two groups, right? This group here and this group here, right? Are blocking out that nitrile. Okay. So this is causing steric hindrance. Okay, and we looked a little bit at that in the last chapter. What that means is whenever I look at the rate of different groups, a methyl is going to be faster in an SN2 process than a primary, which will be faster than a secondary, which will be much faster than a tertiary. Dr. Morvan, mm -hmm. will we um, will we have to like infer uh, whether or not something is S SN two or SN one based on their orbital arrangement? Like, will we ever have to look um, at something and their orbital arrangement will be the, the same? So okay. remember, we're we're for this chapter we're dealing with um, sp three hybridized. So all of them will, will come with an sp3 hybridized orbital structure. Right? What determines whether something would prefer an SN1 or SN2 has to do with some of the things we're doing right now. So even if we think about this, if I had a primary, right, would a primary be pretty fast as far as an SN2 mechanism? Well, from this rate, yeah, primary would probably be pretty fast. How about a tertiary? Well, tertiary would be very slow, right? So if we look at an SN2 substrate, if it's a methyl or a primary, that's I'm already seeing that if it's a methyl or primary, SN2 sounds like a good deal. But a tertiary for an SN2, that doesn't sound like a good deal. The sterics are gonna be pretty bad, right? Now the stereochemistry, that's, that's gonna be more of, um, what is the impact, right? So if I see a reaction, let's say that I saw this reaction and I saw that it was inverted, and that's what that's what we can call this, right? Is that we've inverted that stereochemistry, right? If I see a reaction and all I get is inverted, what should that give me a hint? Experimentally, that should give me a hint that this is SN2 because I know that stereo specifically, this is an SN2. I don't know what SN1 is yet, but we're going to learn that in a second, right? So whenever we look at these, it's not the hybridization, because remember, these are all going to be SP3. It's going to be the other thing. So we're going to look at stereochemistry. We're going to look at substrate. We're going to look at leaving group, nucleophilicity, and solvent effects, right? So we're going to look at several different things that that'll help us to, to predict whether something is SN1 or SN2. For stereochemistry, if I looked at the stereochemistry and I got 100% inversion, that's a pretty good sign that this is going to be SN2, right? If we look at our substrate and we've got a methyl or a primary, because of the rates, that ind indicates that maybe this is an SN2. Okay, does that help? 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the other the other position that you can have here, right, is the beta position and the sterics around the beta position, right? So if we looked at this one, this would be slower. Than this one. Now the alpha positions, which is our chart up here, right? These are all alpha positions is going to have a bigger impact than the beta positions. But we should also consider the beta positions, beta positions when we're looking at the, the speed of a reaction, right? Again, a beta position can cause steric hindrance. And for an SN2, that steric hindrance is going to be the thing that controls, uh, that helps control our rate. The other thing we can look at is nucleophiles. And for this one, we're going to be comparing strong nucleophiles to weak nucleophiles. And notice here, the strong nucleophile is the oxygen negative. That's going in, and that's going to give me a faster reaction than the weak nucleophile. The weak nucleophile, in this case, we both end up with what would result in alcohol, the pot product for both of these will be an alcohol. So I have a choice. I want to form an alcohol from this alkyl iodide. And if I use the alkoxide, the strong nucleophile, this reaction is going to go faster. If I use the weak nucleophile, right, this is going to go slower. Now, part of these have to do with nucleophilicity. And when we see here, most of our strong nucleophiles are going to be the, the minus. So if you notice, every time I draw the SN2, I tend to draw the nucleophile as a negative. That's kind of a hint to remember that we're looking for strong nucleophiles versus weak nucleophiles. The other thing that can impact uh, the nucleophiles is the steric hindrance of the nucleophile. Uh, and I just misspelled hindrance. Okay. So if we look at steric hindrance, um, we have, let's say that we looked at the CH3O, right, versus Okay, we have these two alkoxide, right? This one's going to be a better nucleophile. Right, it's small. It doesn't have a lot of steric hindrance. It's going to be faster. Right? This one is going to be a slow nucleophile. Now, the oxygen negative part of this is the same. But now this is a big bulky group, right? That's going to slow this down, okay? And you'll hear the term bulky nucleophiles, right? Or bulky, bulky bases. Um, this tends to be a slow nucleophile. If it's a slow nucleophile, it has a tendency to act as a base. Right? So you'll hear the term bulky base. So steric hindrance can have a problem. Uh, can have a can have concern. We can also have things that make really good really good nucleophiles because of their structure. Okay. 
all of these are rather good nucleophiles <coughs> because they're linear, right? They're linear. You can think about these as nucleophilic arrows. There is, there is limited to no steric hindrance that we have to worry about with these. So for nucleophiles, negative nucleophiles, right, are stronger nucleophiles than the neutral form of those. And although uh, this book doesn't have it here, you could also put, right, you could put um, the thiols as well, although the thiols are pretty good nucleophiles. Um, if you have the negative form versus the neutral form is, is what they're trying to refer to. We can also have steric effects, right? And so the less sterically hindered, the better SN2 nucleophile. The other thing we can look at um, in our things to, to watch for are our steric our solvent effects. Okay. And we're going to have two different types here. We got protic solvents and aprotic solvents. What happens with protic solvents is if we have, let's say, a if we have our, our, our nucleophile, and let's say that we're going to have a uh, methoxide coming in as our nucleophile, what happens with the protic solvents, and let's say that we use methanol as our protic solvent, you get a very strong solvation effect with protic solvents. So what the solvent is trying to do is stabilize It's tried to stabilize that anion, right? So protic solvents have a have a stronger salvation effect than than non protics. So if we think about this versus over here. We still have stabilization based on, let's say, acetone. But what's the driving effect in acetone? Well, the acetone is just the inductive effect, right? So I've got a partial positive, partial negative. So here, instead of having a hydrogen bonding effect, right, a stronger effect, what I have here is a dipole ion effect, right, which is going to be weaker than the hydrogen bonding effect. So I still get solvation here, but a weaker solvation. So if we think about this, what's happening is, is that the anion and protic solvents actually come in with that kind of bound up with the solvent. So its sterics is increased by the solvation effect, where in a polar protic solvents, it's a weaker effect. And you can think about that anion is not having a tight solvation ball around it, right? Um, and so therefore, when we look at the, the rates, right, an SN2 prefers a protic solvents. If we look at some data on this, we can see the effect can be pretty big, right? If we look at our bromide here, right? If we did this in methanol, we see that our rate is one. If we do this in DMF, which is a polar product solvent, uh, this is DMF, dimethylformamide. Right. We can see that we've increased that rate to 21,000 compared to one, right? So we've got a significant increase in our solvent. So this steric effect brought on by the solvation could be very large. <coughs> oh, 
okay, we're going to have to look at SN1 on Wednesday. So we've looked through SN2. We looked at our different ones on Wednesday. We'll go through SN1.